So this morning I'm continuing on exercising the spiritual gifts. So these were the points that I didn't get to last time because I realised I'd, I'd done quite a fair bit and we would have been here for probably another half hour, which I didn't think was really fair. The, uh, the sessions at uh, conference are an hour and a half and you sort of get towards that 45 minute mark and you're ready for a bit of a stretch and a break and a, a quick uh, drink and then to come back. So uh, we don't want to carry on too long. So last week we looked at how the spiritual gifts are under the whole Trinity. So the spiritual gifts, they draw their power from the whole Trinity. We looked at there were different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit, different kinds of service, but the same Lord and different kinds of works but the same God. So Paul writes that when he was talking to the Corinthians. So we see that the Holy Spirit, God and Jesus are all involved in the working of the spiritual gifts. They're given by the Spirit, but it's only when Jesus is the Lord of our lives that that they can be given. And it's through the power to exercise them comes from God. They are all working together. We looked at how the gifts are for the common good. So the gifts are for the common good. The Holy Spirit gives them to us so we can outwork them in the community for the common good. The Holy Spirit is actively giving gifts. We just need to take them. He has stood there now with his arms open, ready to give gifts. We just need to have the faith and the courage to take them. And when we do and when we use them correctly, that they work to bring people together and show them the true nature of God. So when they're used correctly, they draw people in. We saw that with the story of Peter and John, how the crowd, after they healed the lame man, grew exponentially and how hundreds were saved that day because an outworking of a spiritual gift correctly draws people in. We saw that the gifts operate by a sovereign spirit. So the spirit remains sovereign at all times. It's not um, God taking over, Jesus taking over, or us taking over. It's always the spirit, sovereign. That we only operate in them when he gives them. So we may have a particular gifting, and it's not uncommon for people to have a gifting in an area that the spirits really bless them in and poured them out in. Brett Linder, who we had earlier in the year, has a healing ministry. He operates in that healing gift. So people can have that, but they have it because the spirit gives it to them, not because it's something that dwells in them. So that that there is a balance between the Spirit's sovereignty and our faith. So we can have faith that we can work in the gifts. We can have faith that, that we can step out and go, I'm going to pray for someone and I believe that the Spirit will heal, but then the Spirit needs to step in and give us that gift and do the healing. It's up to us to position ourselves for God to act. So we need to put ourselves in a position that God is able to act. And that can be through um, our lifestyle, the way we operate day to day. It can be the position that we put ourselves in when we go to pray for someone. Taking that moment before you pray for someone to go, Holy Spirit, give me the gift that I need to minister in this situation. Sometimes we don't even know what's needed person could come up and ask for prayer for healing or they could just want prayer for clarity or something and the Holy Spirit steps in and reveals a whole different area that we need to pray for but we need to position ourselves for the Holy Spirit to be able to do that. So we look at our scripture in in, um, 1 Corinthians 12 and it says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one is speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. There's such a reassurance. I was reflecting on that over the week, and there's such a reassurance there because we've all had instances where someone's come and they've used a spiritual gift and they haven't quite got it right. I've done it. 
I'll put my hands up and say I've done it. Anyone who stepped out in faith, sometimes it doesn't quite work out. But if the person is able to say Jesus is Lord, then you know the Spirit is there. They may not be listening to him fully, but he is there. So we need to um, be reassured then that even though we might have those instances where someone just really misses the mark or doesn't quite achieve, if they're saying Jesus is Lord, you know the Holy Spirit is there. There is, there is something at work there. Now there is a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit, and a variety of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to the other an utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit by that one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are powerful by one, by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. He apportions individually to each one as he wills. He gives them to people as they're needed. They're not a possession that we can hold on to and grasp and say, this is mine, this is my gift. It's something that the Holy Spirit gives us in a moment of need as he wills. And if his will is for us not to have it, then we won't receive it. So what else do we learn as Paul teaches through uh, the use of the, the spiritual gifts. We learn that it's we're outworked through teamwork and unity. Uh, Paul continues in chapter um, 12, if you read through past that verse, past, uh, to verses 12 to 31, uh, with a section entitled, One Body with Many Members. He starts to talk about the church and how it operates. So it's easy when you read... Um, and, and the way our headings work in the model bi modern Bibles make it this way as well. When you read through and it's got a title and it says spiritual gifts and then you've got your title which says one body, many members and then you've got your next title. It's easy sometimes to think that Paul's dealt with a topic and now he's moved on to a new topic. Important, somewhat interrelated, but it's a, it's a new topic. And I know when I was younger and I read the Bible, that's exactly how I thought that it worked. So it's easy to think that Paul's dealt with the spiritual gifts and now he's moving on. However, Paul's teaching of spiritual gifts starts in chapter 12 and it finishes in chapter 15. Everything that he teaches in between those two chapters has relevance to the use of the spiritual gifts. Over the next three chapters, he covers how it is important for us to be in the right place to receive and exercise the spiritual gifts. So in the second half of chapter 12, Paul is making a point that teamwork and unity are essential to the working of the gifts and why. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, he says, For, for in one spirit we are all baptised into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we are all made to drink of the one Spirit. When we give our lives to Christ, when we, when we hand over everything to him and Christ comes to live in us and the Spirit comes to dwell in us, we are automatically linked together. The same Spirit is received by anyone who becomes Christian. It is the same Spirit. We're not talking about parts of the same Spirit. Someone doesn't get the active healing part of the Holy Spirit and the next person gets the gift of knowledge in the Holy Spirit, we all receive all of the same Spirit. It's also not this Spirit or that Spirit. There's not different Holy Spirits that we go and receive. And this is something that was a common belief in the time in Corinthians, you know, in their time through the, the Greco-Roman religions is you could receive individual different Spirits 
it still exists today. If you look at the Hindu religion in particular, they've got so many different gods and you can receive blessings and infillings from all these different gods. So they're never fully united. They're always somewhat separate. And different gods fight against other gods and can't stand them. So their people do the same thing. And what um, Paul is writing here and what Jesus did in the cross is he gave us the same spirit so we are united as one. For in one spirit we are all baptised into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves or free and all were made to drink of the one spirit. We see the results of this in every major move of the spirit through the Bible in Acts in particular where they're talking about um, the Acts of the Apostles and the Spirit moving in power in that region. But if you look through history and you read where there's been spiritual revivals, we see this repeated time and time again. A real, uh, the most recent sort of one that, that, that people refer to a lot is Azusa Street in LA in 1906. And Azusa Street, for those who don't know, was really, they, they see it as the birthplace of modern Pentecostalism where the spirit moved in power for the first time in LA. Now, Americans like to think it started there. There's a whole heap of debate about where it really started. There was moves in Australia, there was moves in the UK, in Europe. But what we saw in that time was the spirit moving through the world to bring a new movement and realisation of him. But in America, when you look at their meetings, they included every race, they had every culture, they had every denomination, they had sections of society that would never mix, some of them because the laws of the land didn't allow it, mixing together, worshipping together in the spirit. They were one body. The spirit filled them and all the barriers that were there, the cultural barriers, the denominational barriers, the race barriers, the legal barriers were just shattered and thrown away and they worshipped together as one. Because when we are one body, we function best when all parts of the body work together. We work best when all parts of the body work together. I'm sure most of you have seen, because this is a common comedy thing, where someone gets a numb arm, they've had surgery or something, and they've had a numb arm or their face is numb, and they try and they do something that's normal, and you know, like they throw their arms around because they can't move them, and everything becomes awkward. Easy, everyday tasks become awkward. It's the same for us. If the body of Christ isn't working together, if it isn't united and working in teamwork, then we have that numb arm. We're dragging something along because it's not going to move itself. We need to be working together. And that is hard because there's things that, that draw us apart. There's distractions. There's there's instances that come up, there's just day-to-day -day stuff and it gets in the way of the work of the body and we need to be willing sometimes to put that aside and just move forward. We also need to be aware that as one body, uh, so we also need to be aware as one body how, we work in, how the work of the spiritual gifts affects the whole body. I wrote that sentence very poorly. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, If one member suffers, then all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. So we need to be mindful how we outwork the gifts. We need to be mindful how we outwork the gifts. This is why um, when we look through the Bible and we read through Acts, we see teams of people working together. It's very, very rare that you see one person working on their own. Philip is an example of that when he went to Samaria. He went on his own first. But then when the Spirit moved, a team went up to join him. We see Peter and John often working together and moving together. We see um, Paul and firstly Barnabas and then Silas working together. And then Barnabas went off with 
John Mark. So we see that there was teams already working, already moving. They very rarely went out on their own. Paul's mission trips, he always went back to his home base. He went back to his home church after the first one to give a report of what was happening. Then he went to Jerusalem and he was heading back to Jerusalem when he got arrested. He had himself a covering to make sure that he was working correctly because the outworking of the spiritual gifts relies on us working together. I'm sure none of you are surprised to hear that sometimes we get it wrong, especially things I just said it. Sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we miss the mark. So we need teams around us to be able to come up to us and go, you know what, I don't think you were quite right there. Maybe you need to just reflect. It may not be that the word that you're giving is wrong or the way you've gone about it is wrong. It might be the outworking, your attitude in the outworking. It could be a whole number of things. But if we don't submit ourselves and allow ourselves to have people come and talk with us and lead us, then we risk ending up in a place that we can do real harm. An example that I was reading about was a lady who felt she had a prophetic gift and she was in the church, but she didn't exercise her gift in the church. She caught people in the car park or she'd go into their homes and she would give a prophetic word. And the pastor of the church became aware of it and went and spoke to her and said, look, I'd really prefer that you didn't do this. If you're going to, you know, if you feel you've got this gifting, then we can, we can bring you into this and we can start seeing how that works. And, and she didn't listen. And then one day she gave a prophetic word to a lady that was pregnant that her, she was going to have a son and he was going to be blonde and he'd have blue eyes. So when a girl was born who had dark hair and dark eyes she realised that she didn't actually have the gifting that she thought she had, but she hadn't been willing to submit herself to the covering of team. She hadn't allowed herself to be led. So a, a potential prophetic gifting was stopped. We, we need to be careful that we don't add our own spin, our own thoughts, our own feelings, our own understandings, our own limitations especially when we're praying for healing. We can't allow our own limitations, our own thoughts of how far this could possibly go, creep into a prayer of healing because then we're limiting the work of the Spirit because if we speak those words out, the person hears it and goes, oh, that must be the end point of this. That's where it stops. And that's where working as teams, praying for people in teams and submitting ourselves to teams allows us to have people just to go, I think that may have been you, Bill. Operating in the gifts in the body gives the best possible safeguard for the incorrect use of the gifts. When we're willing to say, I believe I have this gifting, I feel the Lord's leading me in this place, but then you're willing to operate it in front of others, in front of loving Christian in, in an environment, then it allows that to grow in a safe space where you're not going to hurt someone else, but you're also not going to get hurt yourself. Which brings us to our next point. The spiritual gifts are best exercised with anointed leadership. Spiritual gifts best operate under spiritual leadership when we're submitting ourselves to the covering of spiritual leadership. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says, And God has appointed to the, into the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various kinds of tongues. That particular passage is quite interesting because it is the only time in the New Testament that the spiritual gifts and the spiritual ministries are numbered. It's the only time that you see Paul write first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. No other place do they do that. We see the fivefold ministry gifts, the gift of the apostle, prophet, and teacher, ahead of the more spectacular gifts of healing, performing miracles, and tongues. So those other gifts, they're very public. They're, very, they're on display. They have an effect. People see them, and they're drawn into them. But we see these fivefold ministry gifts listed in front of them. The reason for this is because good leadership is essential for the spiritual gifts 
to operate effectively. So good leadership is essential for the spiritual gifts to operate effectively. An example of this, and I think I've shared this before, and it's, uh, um, Mark Walker shared this with me, at the Sturt Street Church in the early days when Leo Harris was building it up, it was one of the largest Pentecostal churches in Australia at the time. And they had a time for prophecy, words of prophecy, words of knowledge, or messages in tongues. And it was right after their communion time, they had a time set aside and you were allowed to have three expressions and then you had to stop because that's what's in the Bible. So there was a race for people to get their word out before it started because anyone who got a word during the message, they, they wanted to share the word that the Lord had given them or they felt they needed to pray out in tongues. And they had this moment where they had to get in and there was a race to get it in and get it done. They set that rule up. I was talking with Mark about it. And I said, it sounds a bit, I said, I understand the three. I said, but why that time? Why was it limited to there? Because they were so large, if they just allowed people to start praying in tongues when they felt led, the minister could be halfway through their message and then all of a sudden someone's praying out in tongues loudly and interrupting everybody. Halfway through worship, when the worship team are trying to bring a state of worship, someone would start dancing around loudly, proclaiming they, they, it would be chaos. So they needed to put in a little bit of structure and that structure was a set time. If people tried to exercise a gift outside of that time, one of the senior members of the church would come up and gently touch them on the shoulder and in love encourage them to hold it until the right time or to share it with them afterwards. It wasn't to limit God, it wasn't to stifle the spirit. The leaders of the church put guidelines in place to allow the meeting to proceed to benefit the whole. There's a need to benefit the whole. The spiritual gifts are there to build up the body and to reach out into our communities. But if they're being used in a way that people are missing out, then they're no longer benefiting the whole. They're no longer for the common good. And it becomes more about the person using them than it does about the outworking of the gift. Good leadership follows the prompting of the spirit and creates a safe environment for the outworking of the gifts. We do that here. People come up and they say, I think I've got something to share or if the timing is right, we allow it to move on. But there have been times in the past where we've had to go up to people and go, enough, you need to stop now. Good leadership follows the prompting of the Spirit and creates a safe environment for the outworking of the gifts. So when we start, so when they start to be used, people are open and, recip and receptive to them because it protects people. When the spiritual gifts are exercised correctly, when there's the right framework there, people are receptive to them. If it's chaos, people don't know what's coming next. They're going to close off. They're not going to be ready to receive. Which leads us to our next point. The spiritual gift should be worked in the context of love. You can follow along in your newsletter because Janet's got it there. So chapter 13, it talks about love. And if you speak love, uh, if you speak in the tongues of man or and of angels, but not have love, I am a noisy clanging gong or symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. I statements, I statements, I am nothing, I have nothing. Paul isn't saying that a gift used without love is useless. What he's saying is that we suffer when we use the gifts without love. If we operate the gifts without love, it ref it's a reflection on us, not the gifts Spiritual gifts used without love are far less effective than when we operate from a position of love. We need to use the spiritual gifts from that position of love. There's a reason why it's the first gift of the um, fruit of the Spirit because it's something that should be cultivated in us. Um, we've, I've heard stories of people where they've given prophetic words and they didn't have love in it and it caused serious damage we need to operate all the gifts out of a position of love because if we're using the gifts out of a position of love, then we won't be selfish in our use of the gifts. 
We won't be wanting to pray for healing so we can feel good, so we can say, look what I did or look what the, God, the Spirit did through me. We do it from a position of love because we legitimately and honestly want to see that person healed. Love forces us in a good way to have the other party's interests at heart because the gifts are for the common good. The gifts should be modulated by love. Love also keeps our faith in balance over exuberant expression. And eventually the spiritual gifts will capitulate to love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 8, it says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will all pass. When everything else has faded and gone away, when we can't remember words that have been spoken, the love remains. The love remains. As long as God exists, love exists because God is love. There will come a time where the spiritual gifts don't need to be here because Christ has returned and we're living in that new kingdom space and they will pass away and they'll be done but love will always remain. So we need to operate from a position of love. They need to be, love needs to be involved from the very beginning of the process to the very end. And I would challenge you that if you can't bring love to a situation, it is better for us to do nothing. If you can't bring love, it is better to do nothing. So finally, in a fitting and orderly way, we've, we've sort of discussed this already, so we'll really quickly shoot over this one. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, it says, but all things should be done decently and in order. So we need to allow space and freedom for the spirit to move and the expressions of the gifts, but we don't need to fall so far that that's all that we're doing because we're called to do so much more than that. It's a tricky balance to strike. And if, we need, if we're being honest, most churches probably err too far in the other way of keeping the spirit sort of more bottled up. And at times, we've probably done that as well. And we need to be mindful of that. We need to make sure that we have the balance right. And it's easy to fall into that place because the use of the gifts can be scary the use of the gifts, when we see the gifts manifest, it can, it can challenge us. It can really challenge us. For the Corinthian church and other Greek churches like it, was, the, um, Paul wrote this to prevent them becoming like the cults of their day where they would go into trance-like states and they would dance around and it was just chaos. And he's saying, we're not that. We have the true spirit. We need to reflect him in a way that is fitting and honouring of him and not treat him like the other gods that are around this is something that the church has struggled with since the Spirit arrived. We know this because Paul's writing about it. And the early Australian Pentecostal church had a list of allowable manifestations of the Spirit. They had a list and it was distributed. And if things fell outside that list, you were challenged on that. The person who, was, um, who had the experience with the Spirit would be challenged as to whether it was really the Spirit. The teams that were involved would get together and they would pray and they would seek the Spirit. Is this of you? Or was this something else? So they had lists. This is something that the church has, has struggled with. We need to find the balance between spiritual fervour and effervescence and good order. We need to strike that balance. We need the freedom to operate and exercise the spiritual gifts and to see them outworked in our churches and our communities. We need to find that freedom, but do it in a way that glorifies God and draws people to him and not drives them away. We have all seen reports of churches where the spirit has moved and the spirit may be legitimately moving. It may have been an atmospheric thing. And you see what the people are doing. And sometimes, personally, I've gone, oh, no. Really? Because sometimes if we get too carried away and we get too into it and it stops being about the spirit and it starts being about the situation that we're in, people see that and they get, they get drawn back. But true spiritual activity attracts people. And we need to find that balance. So when using the gifts, we need to keep in mind the primary principles 
of how the gifts are used. So they are used under the Trinity. They are used for the common good, by the sovereign spirit, through teamwork and unity, with appointed leadership and in the context of love, in a fitting and orderly manner. When we have those things right, we need to be willing to step out in faith so God can step in with power. As I close, I just want to share this quote with you from Pastor Barry Chant. He says, With due respect to justifiable fears that some people go too far with the charismata, the greater danger is most people do not go far enough. What if we go overboard? Well, as I have pointed out, we do need to be careful, but it is worth remembering that it, is when, it, is that it was only when Peter went overboard that he finished up walking on water. We need to be careful, but we don't need to be careful to the point that we do nothing at all. Because if we do go too far, the spirit is bigger than us. He's bigger than anything we could say or do, and he is ready to pick up what we drop. He is ready to stand in when we do things wrong. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your spirit We thank you for the gifts that he gives. And Lord, we just pray that as we we start to explore the spiritual gifts and, and the working and the outworking of the gifts, Lord, that you just bring us into a right place with you. That, Father, that we have the right understanding of how to outwork them and and to exercise them. Father, we thank you that you have put things in place for the protection of your people both us outworking gifts and others as they receive. So Father, we just pray for an outpouring of your spirit this morning into this place, an outpouring of your spirit and a handing over of gifts in Jesus' name. Father, we pray that people have the courage to take the gifts that you are handing them, that they are open and receptive to the leading of your spirit. Father, we thank you for this new creation place that we stand where we are able to work with authority and power. And we just hand this over to you, Lord, and we say we are here and we are ready and we want to be used by you, Father, in whatever way you lead us. And we just lift your name and we praise you. Amen. If you would like prayer, please feel free to come forward and we will pray with you. Uh, If you're staying for a coffee, we'll see you in the canteen. But if you have to run off for the week, we pray you have a a blessed week. Um, Next week is Mother's Day. Um, I'm over at the Mornington Church. So um, for all the mothers that I won't see next week, happy Mother's Day for next week. And we will see you um, next week. Thank you.